another two minutes and then we can get started. Very excited after the, the, the keynote this morning. I really liked uh, Alisa Knight's uh, keynote, Hacking the APIs. Okay, uh, so I think we should get started now. So I welcome you all to this session about breaking down the barriers between the pro code, low code and no code to accelerate innovation. My name is Puneet Makwana and uh, I will be your host for this session. So I've been a solution architect with WSO2 for a couple of months, but I've been in the enterprise integration space for uh, more than five years. Uh, prior to joining WSO2, I used to work for a SaaS provider, mainly looking after the integration platform. Uh, prior to that, I've worked in the data integration space, integrating data from multiple systems, market mix modeling, advanced analytics, to helping uh, enterprise with business analytics. So integration is something that has been the common string across uh, all the roles that I've played. So in today's session, uh, my plan is to go through some of the, the trends that we see in the industry, uh, see how we can, uh, and, and moreover, you know, uh, you know, if the time permits, so I'll try and rush through the slides. Uh, what I want to do today is uh, show you our tool, the tool that we have uh, to solve these problems. And, and of course, uh, I would like to tie in or build upon on what uh, the two amazing keynotes for API days have been, right? So let's start with uh, the first important point that I took away from um, Micah Munsen's uh, keynote yesterday, right? Very fascinating keynote. So one part he said is, uh, you know, he definitely sees the no code revolution to take over, right? That's the only way he sees that APIs can grow. So that's that's one point. And the other point that I took away from uh, this morning's uh, hacking APIs keynote is about the secure coding best practices, right? So while we do want you to have no code and give all the powers of development APIs in the hands of uh, what I call as uh, low code or no code developers, but we also want to ensure that you do it in the most secure way possible so that you don't end up with, uh, you know, remotely controlling those police cars as we saw this morning. So let's dive straight in, right? So what the approach that I'm gonna to do today is uh, we'll have a look at uh, two sides of the challenges. We'll see how, uh, how do we accelerate innovation? And once we've seen that, we'll talk about the barriers that we have, you know, in terms of uh, the developers, right? And uh, yeah, and then, then hopefully I, I get through the slides faster and then um, I want to show you how to build your own integrations in a seamless no code low code and full code manner okay let's let's dive straight in and, and yes i'm definitely planning to leave five or ten minutes towards the end so that uh, you guys can ask me if you have any questions i'm sure all of us are uh, like, like how i am i'm sick of the term the new normal right so 2020 has been a momentum of change you know COVID has rapidly change how enterprises have transformed themselves, right? So it has uh, what McKinsey and Co reported is that the digital transformation that usually happens over seven years times has happened in few months time. Companies that were nimble enough to transform have, have found themselves victorious and others who couldn't had to shut down their shops, right? Another trend that has emerged from this is due to all the digital transformation that has been happening, there has been increase in the enterprise integration platform as a service space. There have been reports where, uh, you know, businesses like restaurants, for them to be productive, they have to integrate with at least 
20 plus APIs, right? Think of the Ubers and the Uber Eats and the, you know, the Deliveroo's and, and the others, right? So they have to. So it's not a choice that they have. They have to if they want to stay productive and uh, meet the growths in the deliveries and the remote deliveries that, that they do with the food. Another trend that has spun from this is use of cloud applications. The use of the cloud applications today is the highest than ever. Every enterprise, every business has got more and more applications and majority of these are on the cloud. So that's another trend to watch. Other observation that we've had and, and, and it's very well echoed from the Harvard Business Review's report, right? 70% of these digital transformations have failed. Our observation has been that the main reasons behind these are, you know, organizations have tried to change, not transform. They've tried doing something radically different than what their core business was. That's the biggest reason for the failure of the uh, digital transformation projects. The other uh, points can be attributed to the centralized waterfall agile approaches. Skill gaps, skills, skill gap, this is the most important topic, right? So if digital transformation involves migration to clouds and, you know, uh, for example, a cloud provider like AWS has got 200 plus services. So you need skills to identify which of these services are going to be useful to you. And after that, you need skills in those services to adapt and implement it to, to your organization. Other points includes not having an outside in approach. Most of the enterprises did not focus on the customer. Instead, they ran with initiatives led by their central IT teams, you know? So focusing on customer for digital transformation is a must. The other factor is time to market. Most of these projects take a long time to implement. And uh, by the time most of these uh, projects were delivered, the requirements often change. So timing to the market is, is, is very critical in terms of uh, the success of these digital transformation projects. And last but not the least, as part of any large IT project, there was always misalignment between business and technology uh, departments, right? Business wanted something uh, which was not very well communicated and it ended up being implemented in a different way. So these were some of the challenges uh, which led to failure of the digital transformation projects. Digital transformation is definitely uh, challenging, right? Because it requires these enterprises to navigate through what we call as the messy middle, right? It's a combination of the complexity involved, the skills required, and the planning of these processes. So that's the main reason why most of these projects fail. To succeed, what we realize is businesses need a platform. Now, we call this platform as digital business and technology platform. And, and technically, yeah, it's not, it's not the term that we call it, but uh, in the latest slides, I'll show you how Gartner also talks about this platform, right? So what businesses need is rather than focusing on the underlying complexities and the plumbing part of it, they simply need a platform that creates a level of abstractions. You know, It allows the developers to create these functionalities in an iterative manner to realize the value, right? They don't want to get their hands dirty with the underlying Kubernetes or the cloud native foundations, 600 plus services to, to implement, right? All they need is, is a, a platform-based approach where they can start delivering functionalities, these experience to their customers in an iterative manner. So now that we agree that uh, platform is important, let's have a look at uh, the other side of the problem, right? Uh, as a topic says, the chasm that exists between low code, no code, and pro code. So let's see um, what I have here is in this section, I want to highlight some of the key industry codes that we've noticed, uh, which uh, help us see things in this direction. Okay, so let's get started. So the first code that we have here, um, so again, so building up from the previous uh, premise that definitely a platform is important, right? But uh, here's a very popular quote from uh, Jeff Lawson. So Jeff Lawson is the CEO of Twilio. And um, he believes that creating these unique digital experiences for your customers is going to be the only differentiator that you have in the competition. Now, you could buy all the products that you have, right? You could buy each and every service that exists on the world. But if you don't spend time customizing those to your customers and creating those unique digital experiences, 
you will not be able to beat the competition, right? So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was a question, hey, do we build or do we buy the platform? The question now is build or die. So build, building these digital experiences is a must for any businesses, right? Which has now led to a premise where every company, right? So either you are into operating uh, trains for a, a country or operating an airline, all you are now, you are a software company. You are a software company that's delivering these products, right? So unlike unlike WSO2 and other software companies, how we develop products and versions, same applies to these enterprises as well. They need to create these experiences and incrementally make them better. Where does this lead to? It leads to a premise which says everyone is a developer. It's not just a development team. It's not just the programmer that you hire. Everyone in the enterprise has to be a developer, right? Let's look at another popular quote, right? So this one is my favorite. It comes from a person called uh, Scott Galloway. Now, Scott Galloway is, is uh, an entrepreneur. He's an NYU process, professor as well, right? So what he says that less than 1% of the world's working population are software developers. And it's only through no code that this power of software can be given into the hands of the other 99%, right? So remember, these 99% of the people are not the developers. They are not the guys who get their hands dirty with the code. So let's have a look at what these profiles are, right? And building upon the same premise, the challenge that comes in is uh, we've got the existing developers, right? And, and of course, these are the names that you see of the developers very often, but uh, so, so these, 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 although these are new names, but we know them, right? So who are these enterprise developers, right? So you call them enterprise developers or what we call as the full code developers, right? These are the guys who actually, uh, you know, get their hands dirty, have been working with the code, they write their own logic, they typically use low level languages, uh, they have a preference for their IDE, uh, you, you know, they are far more technical. They, they like using a source code repository. And uh, as, as Alyssa Knight uh, said this morning, right, they, they want tools. You want SAS tools, DAS tools, you know, which is scanning uh, the codes for uh, unsecure implementation, you know. So, for example, the, the biggest thing that I took away from this morning from the keynote was uh, embedding those tokens inside your code, right? So these are the developers who are writing that low-level code. And they want a way through which you can have these tools that prompt the developer about security vulnerabilities while being developed. So, so you understand this pro code or enterprise developers or full code developers are very distinct set of developers, right? They are a very different profile. They, they have requirements for things to be done in a certain way. And then we've got ad hoc developers, right? Now, ad hoc developers, I would say they are semi-technical they know what uh, the programming construct is. They have a fair idea of how the platforms works. And uh, they don't like to get ha their hands dirty with the code, but they're happy with something like a drag and drop IDE, right? So, so they are a kind of developers who prefer something like uh, you know, a browser-based or an Eclipse-based IDE where they can drag and drop and get most of their stuff done. So they are the, the ad hoc developers. Uh, they understand the technology underneath it, but uh, they shy away when you see a lot of code on it, right? So that's that's them. And then the most important or the largest set of developers that we have is the citizen developer, right? And we often call them as the no-code developers. So so yeah, just correcting that part, uh, no-code are the citizen part, are the citizen developers, low-code are the ad hoc developers, right? So citizen developers, these are the guys, you know, they are known by the title as business analysts or process experts. They are the real frontline people. They are the guys who are in front of the customer. And you know what? They've got the best of ideas to implement. Now, objective of the, the platform is to enable them to create integrations, right? Because they are the one who see what the problem is. And if we can empower them to solve these problems, um, it, it, it is a win-win for the whole enterprise. So these three developers that we talk about, you know, uh, citizen and ad hoc or no code, low code are very common, very popular. You can group them as a subset. Now, these distinct profiles of developers, they don't go together, you know, because of uh, the different ways and the preferences that they have, they often don't align together, right? So this is what creates a challenge, right? And this is what we call as the low code versus pro code chasm. So what happens is because the working style of these two developers is different, 
there is no way they can work together in the enterprise most of the tools that are available in the market uh, they don't allow a seamless transition between the low code and the pro code so typically the tools or the majority of the tools that we have and not not even the tools in the industry but some of the uh, earlier versions of the tools that we we have even at wso2 most of these are are, are sort of uh, you know tools that allow you to do a low code bit and when you transfer them into a full code and then back to the low code they end up losing the fidelity you know you try, you tend to lose some of the complexity in the code so where does this end up with it ends up with the shadow it applications for the no code and the low code so what happens is this is a parallel set of infrastructure that you have to maintain one for the low code and one for the pro code right and what does what does that lead to is there's no single single code base for all the developments that that's happening the low code people have their own platform with their own code base uh, there are no fancy tools there are no uh, pipeline uh, functionalities available and in the end it it leads to an interrupted development f- developer flow right so that's 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 a, a, another challenge that we see here okay so going back to what i said right so uh, gartner has coined this term which call as the uh, digital business technology platform right so so tying all of this back together right we saw some of the problems with the digital transformation we saw how problems uh, create problems are created because of the the developer profiles that we have and here we are talking about at uh, and we are talking about it at api days right so tying all of these together it's a platform and gartner defines it right so these are not what we see this is what gartner defines it right and and here are the requirements i'm sure all of us are familiar with this i don't want to read through all of them but i i will highlight a couple of them right so they definitely say that there is a need to have a tool that is built for the cloud on the cloud right so being cloud native is the most important thing here now we we've got a wide range of cloud services we want businesses to leverage or reap these benefits of the cloud okay and you cannot think of uh, building everything from the scratch right there's always a bit of green field versus brown field right so you can always have applications which are you're going to develop in the future which can definitely be cloud native but at the same time you want to reuse your existing applications which might be either monolithic applications or could be the applications that you've deployed on prem so that's the hybrid integration which gartner calls them so you should be able to tie all of them together and of course with the agile devops you want something that is supported well by pipeline automations you've got support for data coming in at high, high velocity and then of course you want to use uh, some of the latest enhancements that are happening uh, uh, you know in the the mesh mesh space so yes uh, this this platform sounds like uh, exactly what most of the enterprises need right now just one last slide before i get into what our platform is right now what we noticed is building a platform like right the digital business and the technology platform is not an easy task right if an enterprise wanted to um, embark on the journey to develop that platform they would spend 60% of their budget 60% of the digital transformation budget on this platform right there have been companies uh, like google uh like uh, uber netflix amazon they have tried building these platforms and even some of our customers have made an attempt to build these platforms and to give you a quick uh highlight of what it takes to build platforms like these it takes around 3 plus years with 100 100 and more person teams so it's not an easy process you got those uh you know compositionals you know two pizza teams that are organized around uh you know sec- sections or parts of your applications focusing on the delivery focusing on the reference architecture focusing on the other parts of the whole life cycle right so it's not practical for most enterprises who want digital transformation to build platforms like these so to summarize all the challenges that we have these companies need a readily available platform for cloud native digital tra- innovation so what the requirement here is that if there was a platform available which enterprises could tap on that's what is required right and the requirement that they have from this platform is to make their developers more productive we already have we know that there is a big skill gap in the market what if we could leverage uh, our existing developers and make them more productive and 
help them achieve it in a cloud agile way. So the solution, uh, the attempt that we at WSO2 have made is called Corio. So Corio is our integration platform as a service uh, platform, which is for innovation, speed, and productive. We've recently uh, launched a beta for this uh, product, uh, and I want to give you a quick overview in the next few slides. And hopefully, uh, I'll have enough time to show you how this platform looks like. It's very easy for you to try as well, and I'll, I'll show you how to, to, to go and register for it. So before I dive into what this tool is, uh, let's let's have a quick look of what, what Corio is, right? So Corio is not something that we've built from scratch. We haven't reinvented the whole wheel here. Corio has built from success of our existing products, right? The products that we have today in the, the API management space, the enterprise integration space, and the CM space. So it is the service that we've built leveraging 16 plus years of innovations of our existing products. And mind it, these products are currently used in production for some of our customers as well. With Corio, we aim to deliver the benefits of the cloud native computing. We want to abstract the complexity that it takes for enterprises to roll out a cloud native uh, platform. API led or API focused uh, development for composable and adaptable application is very important. We recommend all of our customers to think of business functionalities as APIs, start with the APIs, build them and then cover them with the application, right? So Corio is indeed a platform that allows you to build APIs. So all the challenges that we've spoken about, the no code, low code, uh, and the speed at which they need to innovate can all be started with APIs, right? So how can we empower the no-code, low-code, and pro-code developers to generate APIs. The key capabilities is the no-code, low-code. So we've, we've, we are best in the best position to solve the problem of the no-code versus low-code. So secret sauce that we have is our language called Ballerina. So Ballerina is our open source language, which, which was created specifically for integration, right? And this is the secret sauce of Corio. Ballerina is a language, it's not a new language, it's a language that we had released in 2016. And the strikingly important part of that language is the source code is a diagram and the diagram is the source code. So here we allow you to achieve full fidelity between the low code and the no code, right? So you could be one of those enterprise developers, you could use your own IDE. Uh, hopefully if the time permits, I want to show you how Visual Studio IDE looks like, or he could use even a Vim for that matter and write the code for the APIs. And when he writes a code in the IDE of his choice, he can always have the same code converted without losing any fidelity for the no code and the low code developers. And uh, uh, this platform also allows you to provide a rudimentary uh, API management and governance uh, while I said rudimentary, uh, what I meant there was that it is one-click deployment. So you don't have to provision, you don't have to add additional configuration to your code to make it easy for API management and governance. It's all part of the product. And the platform also allows you to automate uh, DevOps, GitOps pipelines for the deployment uh, to Kubernetes. And uh, because we have full fidelity between the diagrams and the AI bits, uh, we are able to leverage machine learning, artificial intelligence for data mapping, creating code tips, runtime diagnostics. And, and, and of course, we leverage uh, our customer identity and access management from another service which are going to launch soon, which is uh, the CM or the IAM uh, service, which you call as Asgardio. So uh, let's, let's have a look. So this is what uh, the vision of our architecture for Corio looks like, right? Enterprises typically would start with the business architecture and solution architecture. Now, mind it, these are the tools that we don't have in the platform today, but we are soon going to provide entry points for external applications to integrate with the Corio platform. Once you've got this uh, architecture defined, we allow all types of developers, right? Being enterprise developers who, who want to leverage their own IDE to ad hoc developers, to citizen developers. So, so over the next five minutes, when I show you the tool, I want to show you how the same application will be viewed by all three of these developers, right? And then we allow you to check, no matter how you create these applications, all of these applications are, are checked into a single code repository. 
And then we've got the build test in the deploy pipeline that allows you to deploy these uh, applications, interact with the marketplace, integrate with existing uh, APIs, SaaS applications, and at the same time, uh, leverage the functionalities of the observability, AI, and security. Now, while we are doing this, we haven't reinvented the wheel, right? So what we've done is we've taken the, the open standards and we've leveraged it, right? So on the top, we've got the low-code integration, which I said is based on our uh, uh, Corio, uh, the ballerina language. We allow you to develop uh, microservices, mesh services. Uh, we also have uh, 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 deployment. So the source code repository that we've standardized for now is the GitHub repository. So every code that you write, no matter which ID you've chosen, you check in the code into a GitHub repository. We've got the DevOps and GitOps built that allow you to generate Kubernetes application. Now, Kubernetes gives you that flexibility where you can define or create these applications on Corio and then deploy it in, in either a Kubernetes provider of your choice, could be AWS, could be um, uh, Azure, could be Google, or for example, it could also be your OpenShift uh, on-prem uh, deployment. So you can, through this standard support, you are able to do that. And with that, you get all of the observability, security compliance, AI, and machine learning functionalities built in. What we also provide you is with the integration with the API marketplace and API management, you'll be able to reap all the benefits of the API management out of the box. So, um, you know, again, take away from uh, yesterday's uh, lock note session from uh, Peter, uh, P Petra Zink, right? She said uh, buckets of three. So if I had, uh, if I wanted you to leave with uh, the three key business benefits of what we provide in the form of Corio, Number one is we provide you with those high level abstractions, you know, where your developers don't have to get your, their hands dirty. Uh, you know, they, they could use the low code and the DevOps functionality without worrying about or without being an expert in the Kubernetes framework. But that's not the least, right? If, if there was a need for you to dig into these platforms, we provide you a way through which you can dive deeper and get your hands and get, get the plumbing right if you wanted. Second, we want to give the power of software to anyone in your organization, right? So be it a, a line of business manager to, to, to anyone, anyone in the organization can become a creator. So in, in, in some of the examples that I'm going to showcase this morning, you will see how easy it is for people, for employees uh, without a, a lot of knowledge to create and deploy some of these integrations. And last but not the least, uh, it's a platform that will allow you to create those differentiators, that will allow you to create those digital experiences um, uh, for your customers. And uh, you can leave all the complexities of deployment, skill gap, Corio will take care of all of that. Okay, so um, I think now it's time for us to dive into the, the demonstration or the workshop part of the bit, right? So, so two, two key URLs that you need to remember uh, from the session. Number one is the, the URL of our Corio platform, right? It's, it's very simple, corio.dev. So that's the URL that you need to go to if you wanted to use our tool. And uh, if you are interested in uh, doing the tutorial that I'm doing right now, that's a URL. I'm sure when you get these slides, these links will be in there. So if you want to uh, do what I'm showing you today, uh, in the workshop, you will be able to leverage uh, the same tutorials and do it yourself. And of course, uh, if you have questions, you want to discuss something specific to your organizations, feel free to stop by our booth. Uh, I will be available in our booth. So if you have any questions for me, you want to discuss any specific scenarios for me, I'll be happy to, to, to do that. Okay, so in today's scenario, um, I, I wanted to, to show you how multiple services can be easily integrated. So uh, the hot topic of the past two years in my life has been COVID. So yeah, let's, let's try and see how you can retrieve COVID cases for a specific country and then, uh, you know, sort of interact using uh, APIs with the spreadsheet, right? So yeah, uh, let's, let's dive straight in. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'll stop the presentation and uh, go into our uh, browser. That's where all the magic is going to happen. 
Okay, so I will just take a quick break to see if uh, uh, you guys can see my screen. So uh, yeah, I could I could restart my browser so that you remember the the URL. So the URL that you have to remember is called Corio.dev, right? So the moment you go there, it will redirect you to the the Corio login page. So so that's that's a login page. Now you could sign in easily with your GitHub account or Google account, or uh, if you don't want to sign in, you could also try anonymously. And then if you're convinced and you like the platform, you can then register so that we save all your integration flows. So today, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use my Google login. And as soon as I log in, you would say that you don't have to worry about what tools that I want to use and stuff. So, so I made I made um, promises to show you how the low code, full code works, right? So, so what I'm going to show you in the browser today is for the no code and the low code developers, right? And if you've got pro code developers or enterprise developers like me, now I've got very uh, specific uh, choices, right? Like I want to use only Visual Studio. If you ask me to to code in into a browser, I would completely hate that, right? So I will show you a similar functionality that exists in Visual Code as well, and uh, you could get the same things done. So this is how the, the Corio uh, console looks like. So this is a tool, uh, this is a deployment platform. There are no multiple websites that you have to worry about when you talk about uh, individual functionalities. It's one single console that helps you address the entire lifecycle of your APIs. On the top, uh, we've got the product tour. So if you're trying this product for the first time, I will strongly recommend you to uh, go into the, the product tour. It will walk you through and revise some of the key functionalities of the platform. Uh, you can get help uh, for the active Slack community. Just uh, get in there, uh, review, ask the questions that you have. And if you're like me, you, you'd like to read a lot of documentation. There's a documentation link as well where you can go and read all the information about the architecture. Here's my profile. So you've got a settings part here where you can define all the groups, teams, access permissions, who can edit your projects, who you want to share projects with. So at high level, we've got the three sections here, right? So one is called the integrations, other is called the APIs, and other is called the services, right? So these same structures are also replicated when you click on the menu options here, right? So what I'm going to do is first show you how a, a, a no-code developer interacts with the platform, right? So here's when I go to the integrations, you can see these are some of the pre-built integration templates that we have, right? Now, these are some of the integration templates that we've developed. And if you see most of the common web services like Salesforce, Open Weather Maps, to emails, to, to Twilio, to, to NetSuite. So we've got example integrations that exist, right? So this is an entry point where you can define these integrations. So think of you, if you are an enterprise, and if you have a commonly used enterprise integration patterns, we will open up these integrations for your enterprise. So for example, if I was one of those no code project managers, and let's say, for example, I wanted to implement a use case where whenever somebody raises a GitHub issue, I want the summary of the email to go to the, the, the manager or the, the product manager of that computer, uh, of the project, right? So. If, if that's if that's one of the enterprise integration patterns that I have, and I'm a new project manager, this has, there is a new uh, GitHub project that I want to deploy, all I could do is simply click on the use this integration. Now, I wanted to, before I click on this button, I also wanted to show you that you're not restricted to what it's defined here. If you want to start with this and edit and customize it, you can always use uh, the clone and edit functionality. But uh, rather than cloning and editing an existing functionality, I will show you how to develop this from the start. But before that, I want to just show you a glimpse of how a no-code user would interact, right? So the moment I click on this, uh, what it does is basically creates a copy of the source code and uh, shows me what exactly is happening. And let's say if... Uh, uh, if I'm a project manager and I don't want to understand the complexity of what these diagrams are and I want to get my work done as soon as possible, all I have to do is answer the, the three questions that are here, right? I just have to figure out how to authenticate to GitHub, put the name of the, uh, the GitHub code repository, put the name of the repository owner and define the email address, right? So if I have the new product, I can quickly put in the repository name, the owner, and save, all of this would deploy the integration. I can go live, right? So 
here's an example of how um, a, a project manager or no code user can leverage some of the pre-built templates that you have and go live as soon as possible without bothering any of the IT staffs, right? But what I'm going to do is, this is too simple. Uh, let's try and do something uh, more complicated. Uh, uh, I won't say it's complicated, it's simple. So I'm going to go to the services section. So what I'm going to do here is create a new service for you, okay, an, an API service. And, and believe me, I want to show you these principles that we heard from Elisa and I this morning, right? The coding secure practices. So let's get started, right? Enough of talking. So let's click on the create button. The once I create, click on the create button, you can see I can either start with creating a project here or what is coming soon is bring my own GitHub repository, right? So, so as I said, right, if I'm a pro code developer and I love using Visual Studio Code, this is how the ID would look like. So if you, if you see here, uh, this is the same experience that you get uh, on the web browser. I don't have to interact with the diagram if I don't like. I can simply close the diagram here. I can simply worry about the code. I can write. So the, the language that we support that you are seeing here is the ballerina language. So anybody who's used Java or C or any of the latest languages, it's very easy for you to learn that. Um, you know, if you if you are in, into typing your own code for your services, uh, that's the interface that you would do. And once you check in your code into your GitHub repository, it will follow the same pipeline as you would see as a no-code developer, right? But but yeah, you know, I've got too much of gray hair. Uh, I haven't coded for a long time, so I'll, I'll better stick to the, the no-code functionality. So I'm going to come here and start with, uh, what's my favorite topic, right? COVID. So COVID, and um, uh, just to differentiate it, I'm going to say today 16. So I'm going to say COVID 16 and not COVID 19. So I hit the create button. It immediately gives me a, a way to define the APIs, right? So it allows me to pick what verb do I want to associate. And for our simple use case, I'm going to say I want the get, and I have to define the, the, the path for it. So I'm going to say stat. And what I want to do is I want to also uh, pass in a parameter for the country. So I'm going to say string, and I'm going to say country code. Okay, and I don't want to type the complete. and. Let's hope I use a camel casing correctly. So it's country C lowercase, okay? And that's enough for me to start defining what this API is going to look like. So all I have to do is just say save API. And uh, there you go. So it's the same example that that uh, we saw, right? Uh, it, it, it is the same experience that you get. So on the left, I have the diagram. So today, Puneet being a, 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 a no-code or low-code developer, wants to use the diagram editor to define most of his functionalities, or if someone wants to get their hands dirty. So I wanted to highlight and see some of the packages, right? So today, because it's in just a REST API, it's just got the HTTP package. Uh, let's see, so, so let, let's get started, right? So the first thing I want to do is create a log, right? I just want to log if the service comes. So I'm going to click on the log functionality, and uh, I'm going to say, hey, um, what do I want to log? Good idea. So see, it's already going through my code and giving me artificial intelligence recommendation. It's saying that maybe I want to log in the, the country code and, and then there's no rocket science in that, right? It's just, there's only one variable. So it, it allows me to use that variable. All I'm gonna do is select that and say save. But you know, it, I, I just don't want to log the country code, right? I want it to be more descriptive. So I'm gonna say, hey, edit the code and I'm going to go in the code and I'm going to say here is, uh, uh, I'm gonna put in a string put in the, the, the concat uh, operator here. I'm going to say request received for the country, right? So as you can see here, uh, there's a full fidelity between the full code and the low code, right? So I can just go and update the, uh, the code and I expect that uh, the diagram is going to follow up with that. Now that I have the parameter that I want, I want to use an external service, right? So let's let's get in and I'm going to see here, I'm gonna click here and see what options are, are available here. So you can see these are the different constructs that we have, right? These are ever growing, these are going to change, we're going to add more. And here's what, what uh, I was talking about, the API marketplace, and I've got the API calls. So again, these are what we call as the connectors, right? So there are, uh, several of these, and we're going to keep adding a lot of these as well. So 
you know, talk about the SendGrid versus Spotify, Medium, to Google Calendars, to Amazon SQS, to Redis, to, to MongoDB, to Salesforce. We've got plenty of these, right? Now, because I'm going to interact with the COVID-19 API, I have an option of either using the HTTP connector or I could use uh, the COVID-19 API connector. Now, this is uh, something that's available out of the box. So I think it's easy for me to use that. Now, when I click on this, uh, so this seems like a you know public API. There's no authentication here. So what I'm going to do is uh, to make my life simple. I'm just going to say continue to invoke the API call. Now uh, it's giving me the list of uh, APIs that are available, right? It gives me in a human readable form, so I don't have to go and necessarily search for an OP open API spec definition to figure out what this is. But but you know I'm looking for cases by country and it's not very visible here on, on which function should I use. So all I can do is click on the help button here. So the moment I click on the help button here, what it is doing is it's now parsing through the open API specs, giving me all the descriptions, right? So get status by country. Yes, this is exactly what I want. And what I'm going to do is uh, click on this API. Wow. Uh, I can clearly see it, it accepts country as a mandatory parameter and it returns me the cases and everything, right? So this is the API that I need for the job. So let's get started. I'm going to click on here and say uh, get uh, country by status. Oh, yeah, operation country status. And here it's asking me what's the input variable, right? So it, it wants me to pass the attribute that I'm passing to my API. So I can go here and uh, again, select the same variable here. All of this, this works, and I'm going to say save. Uh, and because I've done reading this, uh, I can simply close this, and uh, I could either stay in the diagram view or I wanted to show you the full code view as well. So I'm going to show the code panel. So if you can see here, it has automatically added the additional uh, libraries, right? So, so whatever is convenient, depending on what you choose, it automatically makes a call. It has added the COVID-19 API. And here you could see it has already uh, instantiated the connector. It's trying to make connections right now. If this sounds too complicated for you, you just focus on the diagram. Okay, so now that I have this now, as you saw, the API returns a lot of a lot of information. And for my use case, I don't want a lot of the information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a restricted set of information. So I'm going to create a data mapping, right? And uh, data mapping is, is is a construct which allows me to you know map existing values to something else. So I'm going to pick up the the response. Now, this is the response from the API. I, I forgot to show you the name. You could change the name, but uh, Let's click here, and the moment I say add, it'll show me all the fields that are coming from that API. Now, as you can clearly see, there are so many of these data points. I'm only interested in cases and the country number, right, or the country ID. So I'm going to do is go on the right side and create a new variable, and I'm going to say uh, in this one, so that I remember, I'm going to say country stat, and um, yep, I would like to be camel case. And uh, other other part of the ballerina language is that JSON is like the a native data type. So we know that what goes on the wire is what you use, right? So I'm going to define my country stat uh, as a JSON, hit the save button, and it will create uh, uh, an object for you, for me. And I'm going to add fields now. All I need now is a country. So I'm going to say country, uh, say save, and uh, add another one, let's say cases. And I'm going to say, so now, now it's time for me to map values to these attributes, right? So in the response, I can already see there's a string called country and uh, the question mark means that it's an optional value. So uh, let's try and map this here. And because it's an optional value, it's, it's telling me that what if it's blank? If it's blank, I would like to type unknown, right? So unknown. And if you see here, uh, it is giving me an error because it doesn't like it, but if I, um, read the, the definition, it says, I don't know what unknown is. So practically it's a string. So uh, it prompts me to, to, to click here so that it adds the double quotes here. I don't have to worry about it. So now that's okay. And then I want the cases, which is a decimal value, again, optional, right? So uh, I think cases is the second object and here's, here's the cases. And because cases is also optional, I should have a, uh, a default value. So default value is zero and it should allow me to, to go as is. And now I see that uh, the definition is correct. Uh, all I can do is go back to the diagram. 
So let's let's make this fairly more complicated. Right now, I showed you an example of an unauthenticated API. Let's see how an authenticated API looks like, right? And I want to highlight the mistakes which Alice and I showed about this morning, right? How do you what's how to use a secure best practices and not hard code authentication inside your code? So here I am. Um, uh, what did I do? Uh, let, let's try again. I'm going to click on this. Go to the API calls. And uh, it's showing me the existing API, but I want Google Sheets. And here's Google Sheets API. So you can see here, right? Uh, I have an option of associating my connections with it. So imagine that you've got production systems uh, and you've got a way to maintain your credentials. So you don't have to share it with a developer. You don't have to share it over emails or not over LastPass. You can have your secrets directly inside your platform. So I could use uh, those secrets or I can add another one. But, but let's assume that um, I'm going to use this connection details, which I've already saved in. And uh, I, I select that. I look at continue to invoke the API. And what am I looking at? I'm looking at appending a row to my existing spreadsheet. OK, so I'm going to click on the append row. And it's asking me for the parameters. So for this use case of this demo, I've got this spreadsheet to which I want to log. And uh, what's highlighted here is uh, this Google spreadsheet ID. So all I'm going to do is copy this value and put it straight in. OK, so now I go back here and put in my Google Sheet ID. And yep, I know I'm not using the right convention. So it's telling me that you need to use codes, which I've done. And then let's look at what's the name of the worksheet. The worksheet is just sheet one. I'm just going to type in here. And this time, because it's prompted me twice, and I don't like being wrong multiple times, so I'm going to type it in codes, sheet one. And now it's asking me, what do I need to log, right? And for the sake of simplicity, I want to log the country code. And all I have to do is type in that value and say add item. And that goes into uh, the cell. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is just save this. OK, now all this while uh, we were typing, um, I wanted to show you something which uh, I should have showed you earlier. So if you try and have a look at the bottom right corner of the screen, and if it's too small, I can read out for you, right? So what's happening here is based on whatever co connectors I've been using, it's automatically giving me the throughput and the latency of this API. So you no longer have to create a test plan and come up with the throughput and the capacity of it. Depending on the code patterns, it's already telling me that uh, I can easily support with the code that I've written, I can easily support 11 requests per minute. And the latency is um, uh, 541 um, or 0.5 or half a second latency, right? So, so, so. So it's already analyzing my code, and it is already uh, giving me uh, those throughput values, right? Based on whatever I've done so far. A couple of also other points that I wanted to show you was uh, so this is uh, as you can see here, right? These are the the client credentials, you know, and as you can see, these are the UUIDs. These are config parameters that are available, and because of the the functionalities available in the Ballerina language, we're able to extract that out. So these credentials that you see. They are inserted into a Kubernetes container at the runtime. It's the most secure way of passing the credentials. So developers don't have to worry about that. So if you're using Corio, we are already implementing those security best practices for you. OK, without talking too much, uh, let's go straight. Uh, and I want to test. So remember, here what I'm doing now is, hey, I've written my application. I want to see if it works, right? And this is the first time I'm running it. And um, it is giving me an example. It's running. So right now, it is just uh, the simple version of it getting deployed in the, the test container zone. And uh, I'm waiting. Uh, this sometimes takes a while because uh, it, it has got a lot of uh, things to do underneath it. But uh, yeah, uh, so what, is it, what it is actually doing is actually it's building a container, submitting that container to the repository, and then putting it in the test zone. So I, I can see it has already done that. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is try it, right? So to try it, I could already use this one here. And I can say, try it out. So you can see it's already generating the, the Swagger or the Open API definitions like. And uh, it's been it's, it's 11 AM Sydney time. And I'm pretty sure they have submitted the cases for today. And I can see, oh, it failed. So there's a glitch somewhere. Yeah, and, and, and it happens. Okay, I'm going to try something else and see if that works or 
uh, I can try and troubleshoot it. Oh, I realize. Um, okay, so I'll show you the, the rookie mistake that I've done is I've created the flow and the flow is working, right? One way to prove you is you can see that uh, the last call was IN and the IN came in here. Now, what I missed was I, I forgot to add the, the, the respond, right? So I did not tell the API to return the payload that we computed, right? So all I'm gonna do is go back to develop uh, stop development, and I'm going to add what we call as the respond construct. So respond is what it does is it, whatever uh, we've computed, it will return that, right? So remember the variable country stat. Um, so that's the variable, that's the cut down variable that we have. And uh, I have to now define the status code. And then we've got a, um, a, a constant in the language, which is called as status okay, which is like synonymous to HTTP 200. I select that and I say save. Okay, so I am 100% sure that this should work. Uh, let's try that. So, so yeah, I'm sorry I have to uh, show you this process twice. So what it's doing here is uh, it's trying to, to run it. So what I'm gonna do is take a quick pause, have a look at the questions. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to drop me a line and I can take them up. So I'm having a look at the chat. Uh, feel free to post your questions while this is happening. Um, okay, uh, so it looks like it is done uh, and I'm going to try again. Okay, so uh, let's get this down to save the real estate, try it out. And what country should I use? Um, I've already used US and IN. I'm gonna try AU again and execute. Ah, oh, this it really worked this time. So you can see it has extracted the country name Australia, and then these are the cases till the date. So seven eight uh, five eighty is the number of cases, and we already got the entry of AU in here. Okay, so so I, I think I'm happy. You know, so the the testing went went good. Now what I want to do is go live with this API, right? So all I'm going to do is uh, come here and deploy this API. So remember there are two parts to it, right? So one part is just developing the the application, developing, deploying this. Now this might take, take slightly more time because it's now ensuring that uh, all the development pipeline is being followed. So this is the pipeline that I was talking about that we provide you with out of the box. Uh, there are features enhancements planned to this functionality where we could plug it into your own developer pipeline. So we could hook it into your pipeline and let's say if you wanted to then deploy your containers into your on-prem OpenShift cluster versus um, uh, you know, the Kubernetes service from AWS, you would be able to provide those hooks in there. So this this usually uh, takes time uh, because it requires you to build those uh, um, containers uh, and push those artifacts uh, straight in. So yeah, uh, I'll have a quick look. If you guys have any question, uh, feel free to ask questions now or uh, we can always stop by our, our WSO booth in the partner village and I'll be happy to uh, answer questions. So, you know, while this is happening, what I wanted to do was uh, let's let's try and uh, uh, focus on the other sections of the, the component, right? So I'm gonna go back to the console. Um, you know, while this is happening, we'll, we'll come back here. It's trying to create a container. Uh, build the container using the libraries that we have, push it to a container re registry, expose that as an API, and um, yeah, it will actually load it into a production cluster. So while that is happening, uh, I also wanted to show you, uh, so that's, that's the API that we are currently developing. It's being managed, but uh, now, another reason why it's taking a lot of time is, is that it's, it's actually applying all the, the security and the governance constraints that you've defined at your organization level, right? So, so all this well, what we saw was uh, the integration bit, right? How to develop a service. But what's happening now is your default uh, API management configuration is also being deployed, right? So you, you probably would have seen that when I executed this uh, API in the test, uh, it 
actually didn't have any security keys, but uh, now that it gets deployed, it will have a proper auth or authentication as per my company profile defined, right? And um, you can go here and uh, let's look at them, the manage API section, right? So this is a part where you will be able to manage your life cycle of the API, right? So you can come in, you can have an API, you can create, move it from the create to prototype stage. So prototype is another uh, way you can mock an API, uh, you could depreciate, you can create a new version, right? So this is where uh, you could deploy your API and uh, you could, uh, so this is where you could define all the API things, right? So what, what name you want to give, what description, you know, you could associate your business owner, technical details, documents, runtime configurations, uh, you know, you can define your course, uh, course header configuration resources. Uh, you can define subscriptions, you know, uh, and, and all of this uh, is very similar to what you've seen in our API manager product. Now, once you have this, you could publish uh, this API. And once you publish this, this API can be made available externally, right? And as a part of the Courier platform, we also have a developer portal. And uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, go to the developer portal to see how an external developer would look like, uh, what, what would they would see in the, the, the API. And I'm doing a quick uh, check here. It is the final stage of deployment and we're expecting this API to go live soon. So uh, what I'm going to do now is, uh, uh, so this is how the, the developer would look like. So in case if you wanted to make these APIs available externally outside your organization, this is how the portal would look like. They could come, subscribe, generate tokens, validate those tokens, uh, review some of the SDKs that are available. And uh, that's, that's a full external uh, experience that they would get. Okay, now what I'm going to do is quickly change to, to services and show you some of the, the observability functionalities, right? So I'm going to click on the observe button and uh, that should allow you, me to show you uh, some of the, the cloud native observability, right? So it comes back to this diagram, right? Based on the, the deployment history, it, it is showing me that it has got a 100% success rate. Uh, the average latency time associated with this API call is 694 milliseconds and the Google one is slightly faster. And here you can see some of the test API calls that I did yesterday, right? And um, you know this this looks fairly simplistic, but let's say if, if I wanted to show you uh, the full functionalities of a more complicated service, the sample service for which I can show you the the diagnostic data. So this is the view that you would see on a daily basis to understand what's going wrong, right? So you could also switch to the diagnostic view. It'll show you what was the CPU usage, what was the latency, what was the memory usage when an error happened. You could go as complex as you would like. Uh, and let's say, for example, if you just wanted to, to read logs, you could simply go to the logs tab here and it would uh, give you all the logs. You could filter it, search for it, or download it. Right, and um, yeah, hopefully this is available. Yep, uh, this is our API, it has been deployed. And uh, what I wanted to show you now is quickly run this API to show that how it would run in a production. So I'm going to use uh, CA now because uh, I'm interested in the number of cases for Canada. All I'm gonna do now is copy this, generates a call command. I'm gonna paste this. So you can see there's a, 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 a API key that is being uh, added here and I'm going to run this call now. So this is the actual production flow where uh, it goes through the gateway, gets authenticated, and just in time, uh, I got a request here and I can see the value here. So, so, so yeah, it completes a full scale development. Uh, with this, uh, I will give another 60 seconds before we close uh, for questions if anyone has. Um, And remember, uh, I'm available at the booth, so feel free to drop by the booth and uh, I can ask, uh, I can help you if you have any specific questions.